time it has been this morning just to be ushered into the presence of God and worship Him as we take that walk to, uh, to Easter and to the empty tomb and the resurrected Savior. And, and so it's been a great time. Uh, so I start off every guess every Sunday uh, as I get up here. Man, it's good to be here. And uh, good morning, Bacon Heights family. And uh, it's, it's good to see you. Um, and I guess I need to give props where props are due. Um, how about LSU now, you know? Uh, LCU. LCU. What I see, well, LCU. Lady Shaps. I don't know what I'm saying. Anyway, you know what I mean. Uh, man, what an accomplishment, LCU. And uh, it's good to be, good to be uh, supporters of them and cheering them on. What a, what a great time. Uh, man, how do you go from there uh, when you make a mistake like that? Uh, <laughs> I actually, I didn't plan on the mistake. I planned on recognizing uh, the lady shop. So anyway, so it was next Sunday's Easter. And before I jump in this morning, I, I want to encourage you. You know, Easter is the uh, single greatest attendance Sunday out of the whole year for churches. And there'll be more people in church next Sunday than any other Sunday in all of the year, every year. And that's going to be the case, and uh, that's going to be the case here in Lubbock as well. And, and I want to just encourage you this week to do your part to invite folks to, uh, to, to come and to, to uh, worship with you, with worship with us here at uh, Bacon Heights. Now, we're adding a service. So we have an 8 o'clock service uh, for your early, early risers. We have a 915 service and then the 1045 service, and that's maybe to help spread out the, the crowd size as well. So you invite someone, a neighbor, a co-worker, a friend, someone who's not been attending church anywhere, you get them here and we're going to have a great time next Sunday as we worship and celebrate the risen Savior. But, but this morning's Palm Sunday. And Palm Sunday, if you just take you back to that week, if you would, travel with me. It's the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. And the high point of this feast was Passover. And, and Jews from all around traveled to Jerusalem during this feast. In fact, some scholars say that there could have been upwards of two and a half million people in Jerusalem on this week, this day. And they'd come to, to recognize what the celebration meant and to, to celebrate Passover. But on Sunday... Something unusual happened. Uh, Kind of an uproar was taking place in the city. Uh, A a gentleman, an individual was riding in the city city of Jerusalem from Bethany on a a donkey. And the crowds flocked to him and they lined the streets and they they placed their cloaks on the the ground so the donkey could walk over them. They, They cut branches off the tree and they waved the branches in the air and and then they celebrated and they shouted. And we see this in Matthew 21. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And shouts and celebration and worship really was taking place. And An uproar was in the city, as I've already said. And so people were asking this question, visitors, guests, who is this guy? I mean, who is this man riding on a donkey into the city of Jerusalem on this day that's caused a lot of people to come and watch and to to be a spectator and to to cut branches off the tree and to sing and to shout? Who is this guy? And they answered him, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth. In Galilee. Do your best with me for a moment to put yourself on the road that afternoon. Visualize with me Jesus entering the, the, the city and the folks who flocked to the city that week, they did so because they had a religious commitment, religious faith, you know, the Jewish faith. They, they went there knowing their Bible, what we would call the Old Testament, the law and the prophets. And, and as they watch this man enter the city on a donkey, and they see this shouting and this celebration, this rejoicing going on, I wonder if it took them back to a, to a prophet named Zechariah. I wonder if these words from Zechariah 
were in their memory that day. Because see, in Zechariah Zachariah chapter 9, we read this, verse 9 through 11. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a coat, the foal of a donkey. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The bow of war will be removed and he will proclaim peace to the nations. If you're a visitor that day, you are coming to to celebrate the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. You have a a Jewish faith background and you know your Bible and you see a man coming in uh, riding on a donkey And, and you hear the worship, you hear the excitement, you hear the celebration, you hear the rejoicing. Why would you not go to this passage in Zechariah and think to yourself, could it be the king is coming? Could it be that, that the Messiah is arriving, this, this man named Jesus, this prophet, Jesus of Nazareth? I mean, just go through the passage. There's going to be great rejoicing. Rejoice greatly. Shout in triumph. Was that not what was happening? Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. There, there was rejoicing. There was excitement. There was celebration. That's what Zechariah said would happen. You read further, and it says that he was going to be riding in on a a donkey. Well, he was, two for two. Could it be we could see the words of Zechariah coming true? And he was going to be a king. That's what Zechariah says. The king is coming to you, and here are the adjectives that describe this king. He is righteous, and he is victorious, and he is humble. Well, anybody who knew about this, Jesus knew that he was righteous. Now, there was no one more righteous than this Jesus. And, and, and if you knew Jesus, then you also knew that he was humble. And just think about that. Rejoicing, shouting with triumph, riding on a donkey. A man's going to be coming, the king's going to be coming, who is righteous and humble. Jesus checks off all four of those. He said, okay, so victorious. Well, he's not victorious yet, but you might think to yourself, if we're If we're good so far, it's just a matter of time before victory is happening. It's just a matter of time until we see victory in the land. Jesus, the king, the Messiah is going to come and take the throne. And when he takes the throne, victory's coming. It's just a matter of time. And then there's two more characteristics we find in this passage of Zechariah. He says, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The bow of war will be removed He'll disarm the nations. No more war. Now, we know that's not true at this point. And on this day, when Jesus was riding into the city, of course there's still war, but it's just, it's just a matter of time until that's true too. If, if Jesus is the king, if, if Jesus is the Messiah, then that's going to come true. And then he says, the very last thing he says is, he'll proclaim peace and bring peace to the nations. That's, that's the other side of the coin of disarming the nations. I mean, could it be that this event that, that these people were witnessing on this particular day, known as Palm Sunday, Jesus entering the city on a donkey with shouts and celebration and rejoicing, could, could it be that we're seeing the words of Zechariah come true? And the Messiah's here. And the king has come. I can just imagine if I was in that that city that day. And and if I knew the religious, the Jewish faith, and I'd come up on it, and I'd studied the scriptures, and I knew this passage, and we were looking for the Messiah, which that, that was all true for the Jews. And I saw this unfold before me. I would be thinking, man, today's the day. It's a new day because the king has arrived. But that was on Sunday, and on Thursday, things changed. On Thursday, he is in the garden, Jesus is, that is, Jesus that is. And they come and they arrest him. 
and, and they take him, and, and, and over the next 24 hours, they'd put him, on, put him on six trials. They weren't interested in finding the truth. They were kangaroo courts really wanting the death sentence. And, and, and because they were Jews, they did not have the power, the authority, the ability to put him to death, but Pilate did. The Romans did, and so they took him to Pilate, and they told Pilate, Pilate, here's this man named Jesus. He's, he's causing an insurrection, and you don't want that on your hands. He deserves to die, and Pilate never connected the dots, and he kept asking questions. What has he done wrong to, to deserve death? He tried to get out of it several times. I'll, I'll release to you uh, uh, one of these two men, Jesus or Barabbas. Barabbas was a hardened known criminal, and the crowds cried out, give us Barabbas. Pilate says, what do you want me to do with this Jesus? Well, crucify him. So Pilate handed him over to be crucified. So they took Jesus and they stripped him of his clothes. They tied his hands and they beat him to the inch of his life. With a cat of nine tails, a, a leather whip. And at the end of the whip, they had shards of bone and glass. And every time the whip would hit the back of Jesus, that would dig into his flesh and it would rip the flesh to pieces. So by the end of the beating, he was mutilated flesh. He couldn't even recognize his back. He was a bloody pulp. And when they finished beating him, they, they fashioned a crown of thorns and they, they placed it on his head and they shoved it deep into his skull. And blood now began to trickle down his face. They mocked him. They, they ridiculed him. They slapped him. They spat in his face. They humiliated him. They embarrassed him. And then they said, okay, now's the time for you to carry your cross to Golgotha. So he was forced to pick up his cross, probably just the cross beam. It's probably weighed around 75 pounds. The cross beam is, is known as the patibulum. And so he picked up the patibulum and he, he walked the roads to Golgotha. And once he arrived at the, the, the Calvary, Golgotha, the place of the skull, they, they laid him on the, his back on the cross and they took spikes and they, they drove spikes through each wrist and they drove spikes through his feet. And they raised the cross up and he hung there to die. Bleeding, bloody, naked. That's a far cry from Sunday. Where did we go so wrong, so fast? Because on Sunday, we were actually thinking Jesus, the Messiah, was coming into town. Zachariah's words matched it so perfectly. But on Friday, we see this same Jesus on the cross. And can I just tell you, no Messiah would ever die. That was their thinking. No king would ever end up on a cross. So whatever thoughts we had on Sunday, surely we were mistaken. Because he's on the cross now. And by the way, you can cross-reference Friday with Zechariah. There was no shouting, no rejoicing. He might have been righteous, but look where his righteousness got him, on the cross. Victory? I don't think so. Humble? Let's try humiliating. The only thing to the story we still have in place is he came in to the city on a donkey. In 1992, I remember sitting in a church for a recital, voice recital. I heard a gentleman get up to sing a song, a spiritual, entitled, Ride On, King Jesus. Never heard it before. And as spirituals go, it's probably not the most popular one that you know of. But I remember sitting there, and as this gentleman began to sing, Ride On, King Jesus, I never have forgotten the lyrics or the song. I don't do this often, but Every now and then I try to put myself in, in, in the shoes of, of a slave. The oppression. 
the hum- humiliating behavior, the injustice. I mean, it's, it's a place where there would be very little hope, if any hope. And yet, when you hear the songs that come out from that time, you, you hear the, that these songs are filled with hope. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. I looked over Jordan, and what did I see? A band of angels coming for me, coming for to carry me home. If, I, if you get there before I do, tell my friends that I'm coming too. Hope in a situation, in a context that was anything but hope-filled. Yet the songs are filled with hope. In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me, give me Jesus. When I am all alone, when I am all alone, when I am all alone, give me Jesus. When I come to die, when I come to die, When I come to die, you give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all of this world, but give me Jesus. Hope. Ride on King Jesus. And the next phrase is, no man cannot hinder me. In those dark times, Discouraging times, depressing times, injustice, slavery. They find songs of hope. And their hope is connected to this Jesus. That no matter how bad life gets, because Jesus is king. I can have hope. Now we know that because of what we're going to get to next week, which is the empty tomb and the resurrection. But I want to spend a moment about the hope we have now. Now I don't know what you're going through. I don't know where you are. I don't know if you're struggling with health. I don't know if you're Struggling with relationships? I don't know if there's just a financial crisis. I I don't know where you are. And maybe you're at the end of your rope and maybe you're thinking, I don't know how much longer I can go on. Hope is not dead. And hope is not lost. The hope is not gone. So Jesus came riding in the Jerusalem on a donkey. And the Jews missed the Messiah. That's true. Because on Friday he was on the cross and they thought no Messiah would ever end up on a cross. But what they failed to see was that Friday wasn't the end of the story. It was just part of the story. Sunday's coming. Now, I want to paint one more picture for you of Jesus. We've seen a picture of the cross. Next week, we're going to see the picture of the empty tomb. But there's one more picture I want to show you. We find this picture in Revelation chapter 21. In Revelation chapter, I don't think it's 21, I think it's 19. Revelation chapter 19. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. 
He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood. His name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. And coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has his name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This time, he's coming on a white horse. This time, there's going to be lots of shouts and rejoicing. He's still righteous. He's still humble. This time, he's victorious. This time, he's going to disarm the nations. And he's going to bring peace. See, what Zechariah said was true. It didn't come to fruition in Jerusalem that week. But it sure is coming true. When he comes back, a white horse. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. For this story. A story that's hard for us to even envision. A story that's hard for us to walk through. But Father, may we walk through it. May we force ourselves to to travel this path, to travel this road. Celebration on Sunday, but crucifixion on Friday. And pain and suffering and blood and death and although in those that situation how easy it would be to how easy it would be to lose hope but Sunday's coming and hope is here and one day you're coming back on a white horse to claim your own. So we thank you. We thank you. It's in Christ's name I pray. 